Thank you all for, um, for making it to this session. It's an absolute honor to be sitting with Joseph. Um, I, uh, I've lived and, and, and I've, you know, I continue to breathe Sassoon, um, having been raised in Bombay, which is today Mumbai, but that's what it was back then. And the impact that the Sassoons left in Bombay, uh, their legacy is, is probably unparalleled and unmatched in terms of not just mercantile enterprise, but also in terms of the contributions to education uh, and social upliftment. So it's, it's a fascinating family, but, but, but an incredible, incredible uh, tale um, of, of, of a dynasty that spans uh, across uh, a fading Ottoman Empire. The East India Company is on its decline, uh, and this family manages to somehow uh, you know, become probably the most well-known and, and powerful uh, mercantile dynasty uh, for, for many, many, many years. We're very fortunate to have Joseph with us, a descendant uh, who carries the Sassoon surname as well. Um, welcome, Joseph. Um, Thank you very much. Thanks um, for having me. I'd like to actually start with, 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 a, with a question that I hopefully uh, you know, encapsulates what is it, what was it to be a Baghdadi Jew, um, you know, back in the 1800s? Uh, it, it, it seems to be an identity that, that captures so many different contours of culture, dialects, beliefs, and, um, you know, very much ensconced in, in, in an Arab culture, in, in, in an Arab civilization. So can you talk us through that? And that would probably set the pace for the Sure. Talk. So one of the things that you have to realize that the community has a history of 2,500 years in, in what is now Iraq, uh, but Baghdad was part of the Ottoman Empire for almost 500 years. And the Jewish diaspora there really thrived, expanded, and had more influence in, in, in Baghdad and what is now Iraq more than anywhere else. It also has its own language, which is the Arabic dialect, but a Jewish dialect, written in Hebrew letters. Now, that seems, uh, um, is it, sorry. No, it's not, yes, there it is. Um, and that is really important because once the Sassoons began trading, it becomes almost like a coded, uh, language that no one can uh, decode. All their correspondence of 100 years is really is in this language. And because of this finding of tens of thousands of the family writings, that's really kind what it led me. And it's an interesting, so it has Arabic, Hebrew, uh, Persian, Ottoman, all combined in, in that language. And, and that was the language that was used. It's still used today for speaking, but no one writes it in, in, in Hebrew letters. Astonishing. Absolutely astonishing. Um, so as, this, this, uh, as the, 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 the first seeds are laid, so to speak, of the rise of the Sassoons, they become really trusted uh, uh, financial advisors of the Ottomans. Now, it's, a, it's an interesting relationship because uh, I mean, the Ottomans are, are, are Muslim and, 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 and the Sassoons are Jewish. Uh, there doesn't seem to be religion coming in the way of commerce and trade, but it's not necessarily an entirely harmonious relationship either between the Ottomans and, 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 the, uh, and the Sassoons. Can you talk us a little bit about that? Sure. It was really more a function of who the governor, the wali in Baghdad, more than about religion. It also depended on the sultan sitting in Constantinople. So sometimes, actually, one of the, uh, before the father of David Sassoon, Sheikh uh, uh, Sassoon, was appointed uh, as what is called Saraf Bashi, the financial advisor and a tax collector. Um, there was also in, in, in the capital itself a financial advisor to, to the Sultan. Um, one of the interesting aspects of what you're just asking is people thought always that the Sassoons were merchants. Actually, they were not merchants in Baghdad. Right. They were 
officials on behalf of, of the Sultan. And, but it gave them huge amount of contacts uh, everywhere in the region, and that served them well later on. So we have, we, we now start entering a space where, uh, you know, the, the Ottomans are uh, not necessarily fading, but you can sense that they are, you know, they are, they are, they are, the, the empire isn't quite what it was. On the other hand, the East India Company in, in India is slowly, you know, almost on its way out. I mean, by 1857, it's not, it's not uh, 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 an entity anymore, and India passes from company to crown. Um, but what really strikes me in, in this uh, in, in the book is this fantastic tenacity of sorts, this, this ability to rise from the ashes, you know, and, and, and build again, and, 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 and a sense of uh, you dare and we'll dare you back, you know, we'll come back, however, however adverse the situation is. Can you take us through how, with the Ottoman Empire kind of fading, the East India Company sinking, and the fact that they had to flee Baghdad. How does that story then un, uh, you know, un, unveil itself? I mean, I, going back to what I was just saying before, it was really a function of who the governor. There sometimes were good governors or bad governors. Um, at some point in the 1829, there is a very corrupt governor who comes in and starts embezzling money from all the major families. And at some point, the father, Sheikh Sassoon, and his son, David, realized that they were at a huge risk, and they fled Baghdad in 1830. Actually, the siblings stayed behind, um, and, and that is really a very important aspect, because there were a lot of erroneous uh, descriptions of anti-Semitism. That is incorrect. Um, and they basically went to, to Bushir for a year. The father died there. And then that's the interesting question. Why did they choose Bombay? Because a lot of these merchant families ended up going to the Gulf or stayed in Iran, in Isfahan. Um, somehow, David Sassoon was convinced that Bombay is a place where you can go there, you can work, religion will be unimportant, and it's all about what your achievements are. And I think that is a really very important aspect. In, in retrospect, he proved very right in that decision, having not known or anything about Bombay. Was there a sense of skepticism or, you know, around the family when he, when he chose to move to Bombay? Were they... One of the downsides of these archives, it doesn't give you a lot of senses of the feelings, emotions that were going on. I mean, I tried to think about it, sitting in Bushir, not knowing anything, packing your young family and going to somewhere else. You really need a lot of mental stress, strength. And, and to an alien land where... To a totally an alien land. He didn't know anyone. He didn't have any relatives. He didn't really arrived with nothing. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, I want to read out a little uh, passage from... Well, not even a passage, a few sentences from your book. You know, he, so, so he arrives in Bombay, and you write, David strived to familiarize himself with the merchants and the commodities in which they traded. He began learning Hindustani. I mean, to think about this gentleman who's coming from, you know, from Baghdad, uh, doesn't know really what, what to you know, get his teeth sunk into, basically, in terms of commerce and trade, and then to flourish with such magnificence. Um, talk to us about how that pans out. I mean, that's really the fascinating aspect. There wasn't a single event or trade that suddenly pushed him to become so wealthy and so successful. It was really step by step. And at a very, very small, I mean, the archives, for example, the Indian archives, he's nowhere in the 1830s because he's a very small trader. But he's learning everything. And he realized at a very early stage two important things, which I think they are still critical. Information about not only your competitors, but about the trade, about international um, factors that affect trade, 
And the second factor that really, really was critical is the aspect of network. Yes. And where he came from and being the well-known family back in Baghdad and throughout the Ottoman Empire, that's kind created the first network. And as time went by, he created more networks. Um, this is uh, uh, David Sassoon. He stayed, going back to your first question, always dressed in his Arab robe. He never learned English. And when he became a British citizen, um, he signed actually with, in Hebrew because he didn't know uh, uh, any English. God. Now, he was married from... I'm sorry, if I sorry. may just interject here. So this is how he, he, would, he would turn up and this is how he conducted all his activities in Bombay. Absolutely. And in fact, when he becomes well-known and attend ceremonies, you know, he would always answer in Arabic. Fascinating, you know. gosh. Um, he was married to a woman that died very early age, having given him four children. Then he married before fleeing Baghdad, and the second wife gave him 10 children. So the combination of 14 children who lived and survived um, basically created a small army, and that goes to the point of, of networking. So this is a combination of all the important people kind in the book. There are a lot of other personalities that I talk about. The, obviously, David Sassoon, his rise. Then his first son, Abdullah, um, who basically inherits the business. Uh, at some point with the move to England, they all anglicize their name, and Abdullah becomes Sir Albert. Then the second son, Elias, who was the one to explore China, expand. And when the father died in 1864, he refused to accept the will and the statement of David Sassoon that Abdullah should be the boss and wanted to have a 50-50. It failed. And from 1867, which is really fascinating, you have two competing companies, both carrying the name Sassoon, David Sassoon and Co. and Edie Sassoon and Co. The fourth personality you see there is really phenomenally impressive. Um, it's actually, as far as I could see, the only woman who was a global CEO at the 19th century, end of 19th century, who run the business from 1895-1901 from Bombay. And, and just if I may interject here, um, uh, David, give, give us, uh, sorry, Joseph, give us a perspective of when she's CEO, how vast is the business already? Not only huge, but very complicated. I was struck by how complicated the business. Arbitrage in currencies, in commodities, loans, investments in directly and indirectly in countries. There is a loan she is carrying in Hungary. I mean, it, it's totally beyond imagination how they managed to get all this information at the time. And it's all being, and it's all being controlled out of Bombay. All controlled from Bombay by her. She was really, she instituted so many business activities that almost can, can be, you know, a seminar for, for a business school. Fascinating. And how long does her, you know, her influence last? Her influence lasts six years. Unfortunately, the men in the family could not stomach her success and they did not stop for one moment of conspiring against her. And it took them six years to dethrone her. And then the end was a disaster for the David Sassoon and company. There's a lesson for us in this, isn't it? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Never dethrone a woman. And, and, and finally, the And the finally, Victor Sassoon, who is a grandson of Elias Sassoon, who basically takes the business outside India in the 1920s to Shanghai, invest in real estates, 
built the first skyscraper in, in Shanghai. It's still called the Sassoon Building. It's a beautiful building on the Bund Street, but loses everything um, about, with the invasion in, in, of the Japanese, followed by Pearl Harbor, and followed by the nationalization of all the family's assets. Great. Um, this brings me to, to uh, a, a very interesting part of your book. Uh, and I'm aware we've got a bit of shortage of time, but I, wanted, I really want to talk about this a little bit. Um, they find themselves now getting into opium trade. And, uh, you know, it's a very controversial subject now, but probably not back then. So two quiz questions interwoven. Um, you know, how do they view it? Do they just see it purely as an opportunity? Um, and that obviously, you know, takes them into probably an emerging space in China, etc. cetera. Um, and how did you look at this impartially as an author uh, who also bears the, their last name? So I think it needs to be put in perspective. 1839 to 1842, there is the first opium war, and then opium is declared legal. Opium constitutes 16% of the revenues of India for about 20 years. Um, opium was also the most um, traded commodity in the world for about a quarter of a century. And last but not least, to give it another perspective, until 1907, you can go to any pharmacy in New York or London or Paris and, and get opium to treat your headache or indigestion. Right. Um, having said all that, it's not a nice thing to think about it in today's world. Uh, my criticism of, of the family was much more towards the end of the 19th century when it became more and more knowledgeable about the impacts, the addiction aspect of it. They saw it as other merchants in India saw it, simply as a commodity, yeah. no different. There are a lot of different aspects. You remember that there was almost one million Indian peasants depending on that yeah. uh, uh, thing. Sorry, we've, we've just been called out for time, but, but I cannot end this conversation with, with, uh, without mentioning um, Siegfried Sassoon. We, so, sorry. Yeah, I, I just want to show very yeah. quickly how sure. amazingly they expanded all around the world and mostly city ports um, throughout Asia and other parts. And this is just, um, the next one is very briefly, their houses, their different houses in, in India, which are, some, obviously some of them are still there. Um, as for Siegfried Sassoon, so one of the things with regard to the family that by the 20th century there were a lot of, the, the, the interest in the business declined. There was still a lot of talent within the family, Siegfried Sassoon, a poet. There is Rachel Sassoon who was the first editor of a national newspaper at a time when British women could not vote even. Brilliant. Ibn Khaldun, the greatest Arab uh, you know, thinker, uh, said that a, the life cycle of fortune in a family is a maximum of three generations of four. Uh, and that kind of pans out with the Sassoons as well. Your thoughts, your final thoughts on? Briefly, I think that the, the Ibn Khaldun, the philosopher, put it, spotted correctly. Uh, political dynasties or business dynasties, when they get to the stage of squandering and wasting, means that their dynasty is, is going to the end. Yeah. Um, great. Um, Joseph, it was absolutely fascinating having this conversation. I wish we had more time. Um, and if there are any questions in the audience, uh, please be happy, you know, feel sure. Right. I'm just uh, adding to your 
very interesting conversation. Thank you. And uh, actually, he's the one who explained to me that the Jews also have Muslim names. I'm a Muslim. Right. And uh, I was so ignorant that I did not know that uh, Abdullah could be a Jewish name as well. Uh, so I thought I should. Uh, uh, Thank you. Uh, I've been signaled frantically to add that we've got to close, but, but Joseph is right here. His incredible book is available for sale, and he will be signing copies, so please grab your copies and get them autographed by this incredible writer. Thank you. Thank you.